Bienvenidos. Welcome to the 47th annual convening of one of the most enriching experiences in our community. The celebration of diversity and traditions known as Tucson Meet Yourself. I am Supervisor Betty Villegas, and on behalf of the Pima County Board of Supervisors and all the residents of our beloved community, I am happy you can join us. Pima County is a mix of ancestral cultures with lifetime and longtime residents and our new arrivals, all sharing the air, the land, and the history of the beautiful Sonoran Desert. Lucky for us, we also share the foods, dances, music, manual arts, and rituals of dozens of different cultural communities and folk groups, all of which call Pima County home. Every year, Tucson Meet Yourself, sometimes referred to as TMY, is our community's shared big tent where we discover, respect, and celebrate each other. Congratulations and thank you, Tucson Meet Yourself organizers, for adapting this year's 2020 festival to the new public health precaution guidelines. This year, TMY has reframed the event to include a socially distanced virtual experience that offers each of us an opportunity to be connected while remaining safe. There is so much beauty, strength, and resilience in every one of our cultural traditions, and I encourage you to join us in support and celebration of them all. Please enjoy all the offerings, and remember, we will get through all the challenges because we are Pima County strong. Welcome to this program, part of the 2020 edition of To Submit Yourself Reframe. I want to take this moment to thank our sponsors. Without their generosity, none of these wonderful offerings would have been possible. First, our major sponsors, Pima County, the City of Tucson, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Arizona Commission on the Arts, the Arts Foundation for Tucson and Southern Arizona, and the University of Arizona College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and the Southwest Center. In addition, I want to thank our presenting sponsors, businesses that stuck with us even in these difficult times. Thank you to Cox, Tucson Electric Power, Visit Tucson, Desert Diamond Casino, and Chicanos por la Causa. Enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to Tucson Meet Yourself. My name is Kate Alexander, Performance Curator for the festival, and I'm so glad you've joined us for Traditions Thursdays, a series of online conversations and demonstrations celebrating and exploring the performing arts. Traditions Thursdays are presented by Cox, who we thank for their generous support. Many thanks as well to Adam cooper Teran, our digital producer, and our interpretation team from Antenna Los Angeles. In this 47th year of Tucson Meet Yourself, and on behalf of myself and the entire team behind this reframed virtual festival, thank you for being part of this community and for your ongoing support. Tucson Meet Yourself has always been free and open to the public, and we like to keep it that way. This festival is for you, and we ask your help to support the continuation of this Tucson tradition. If you can, please consider making a donation at tucsonmeetyourself.org slash donate. Today, I'm so pleased to welcome you to Dances of Gesture in Japanese and Indian traditions. My two guests today are Mari Kaneta, founder of the Suzuki Kai Japanese Dance School here in Tucson, and Nena Bamidapati, Bado Tanatium dancer uh, with the Arthes Dance School. She's also a Kuchipudi dancer. She's the founder of Collectivity, which unites dancers across Arizona. We'll be having a chat about the power of gesture in dance to convey meaning and the processes of learning, teaching, and representing dance communities. And of course, it wouldn't be TMY without some performance. So Mari and Nena, welcome 
Um, Mari, starting with you, would you like to say more about yourself by way of introduction today? Hi, my name is Mari Kaneta. And I'm originally from Los Angeles. I moved to Tucson in 1984 and established our dance group called Suzuki Kai. And we've been uh, uh, with the Tucson Meet Yourself ever since then. And uh, a little while back, um, Nina and Kate, we were uh, discussing how Tucson Meet Yourself have changed and for better since, since that, that time. Uh, uh, I'm here to try to uh, uh, sh share our Japanese, one of the Japanese culture to the uh, community here, which is so diversified and uh, we uh, we've been trying to uh, uh, share our Japanese dance to let everybody know that there are different culture other than their own in this in Tucson. Thank you very much, uh, Nina. Would you like to speak uh, speak more about yourself or your? your relationship with the festival by way of introduction. Sure, um, my name is Nena. Um, I've been a Bharatanatyam dancer um, and a Kuchipudi dancer um, for some time now. And uh, I've been a part of Tucson Meet Yourself for I would say the past five years or so. And um, in my dance particularly, both Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi, uh, gesture is a, a large part of how we communicate through dance. And um, so I think this is an important conversation to have about, you know, movement and gesture. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of the conversation. And thank you both so much for being part of this new thing we're doing with TMY this year to have these conversations where we bring people from different traditions and um, cultural representatives together to talk about these things that um, connect our traditions, but aren't always the things we have the opportunity to explore together. So um, I guess just jumping, jumping right in and thinking about um, dance as movement with meaning and what, what are those meanings that uh, both of your traditions seek to convey? Um, what is that understanding like for for your audiences, and then for you as dancers. Um, I can start. Oh, go ahead. So in Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi, uh, there are, are different types of gesture and movement. So there are facial gestures um, known as abhinaya or emotion and um, hand gestures called hastas and they essentially communicate um, you know people or status so i think for for dancers in Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi uh, a lot of the um, emotion and meaning comes from those hastas or hand gestures so a shikra could mean a man or um, like a, a simhamuka could mean like a lion. Um, all these different uh, hand gestures can really, you know, emote something in us. And what that means for the audience, because that language isn't so fluid in translation, um, we really use facial gestures abhinaya facial emotion to inspire that uh you know connection to the dance within the audience so forehead movements eye movements um an, an example of one would be something called the sachi which is like a look to the right or the left 
Um, and it could be used if you were giving someone like a side eye or you were interested in what they were doing. And those sorts of universally understood expressionists, um, they can really inspire the audience to have an experience with the dance and translate those emotions. But I think it's interesting to see the way hand gestures inspire me to have a relationship with my dance, um, whether I'm talking about a god or, you know, a woman finding, you know, her husband with someone else inside her house. All these, you know, this variety and plethora of situations that you can describe. It's interesting to see. For me, it's always been fascinating how hand gestures can inspire one reaction and facial expressions can inspire another. So that diverse, you know, emotion within dance and those gestures, I think, are really um, interesting to look at when you um, determine the variety of reactions from the dancer to the audience. Uh, for um, for us Japanese dancers, um, the gestures, you, a movement of gestures that Nana just mentioned, we we have that also. But um, as far as Japanese dance goes, a uh, Japanese dance is a dance that we uh, the difference between the Western dance like ballet, uh, ballet and jazz dance tend to leap upward to reach to the sky. Japanese dance, we put our weight to the floor, to the earth. So we're always dancing together with the earth. We do a lot of the male and female dances, which are so different in trying to express, you know. So our, our movement, eye movement, head movement, shoulder movement, everything is so different from male and female dance style. One of the main uh, differences with our legs, the feet, when we do male dancing, a heel goes inward, inward, so that our toes go out, outward like this. Female dances, a toes go in like this. So what we do is we push our heels outward and get our knees together. And uh, for those who've seen kabuki dances and Japanese classical dances that we do, you know, m most of the time it's very slow and very uh, soft movement. And so people, uh, audience does not, uh, uh, how do I say, understand that, you know, we are using all the muscles and nerves from the top of the head to the toe, tip of the toes. And every, every time we perform, we are very conscious about what all the body parts are doing to make it look graceful or to make it more masculine. And um, other than that, we use our eyes and bend, you know, bend our heads according to how we are trying to uh, uh, show that if we're uh, older, older generation, or, you know, woman or that young kids by the tilting of the head, using of the fingers, and uh, looking from the eyes. And in Japanese dance, I'm not sure, Nena, that um, Indian dance, 
when you look at something, you jump from one to the other, like this, your eye movement. But Japanese dance follow a line, a flow, so that you, when you look, you 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 just don't look at. <laughs> if you could see my eyeballs, it doesn't jump from one to the other. There's an invisible line that you follow. Um, uh, 
exercise that we do to make our fingers and wrist flexible. Because normal dances, we, we hold our thumb in, the very classical dances, but there are times that we do need to open and close our fingers one at a time. So that's, that's kind of practice we do incorporate that in our lessons all the time. And we use also use props, fans, fans, to indicate our emotions and what we're talking about, we're trying to express. Okay. So, so much to follow up on. Um, the the sort of invisible lines of eye movement um, is one thing. Uh, where, what, what, I guess, in that, what are the larger narratives that the gesture is meant to convey? What are the bigger stories these different characters? M Mari, you spoke about age and gender. Um, Nana, you also referenced uh, gender, certainly, but also the circumstance in which you are um, giving life to a specific character, perhaps. Do you want to expand on, on those ideas? Um, as far as uh, following the invisible line for the eye movement or the hand movement, it, n none of the movement just go, you know, sh straight out pointing. Everything follows a individual, uh, in, invisible line, and we don't focus, if we point, we don't focus on the tip of our, the fingertip. We're always focusing way beyond when we look. And, and that's the way to capture the audience's attention by doing those movements, following the invisible lines. It's called flow. We call it flow of the dance movement. And it tells the audience to look at where we want them to look. And so what, what we're trying to do is um, Without speaking, narrating what the dance is about, we're trying to uh, show the audience what the dance is about, the music is about. And I'm sure the Nana's dance is the same way. And there are some uh, dances that um, uh, we do that's uh, the audience doesn't understand the meaning of the dance, but uh, we, we use the movement to follow the flow of the dance movement, and then we conveyed the lyrics with the movement, and so that even if you don't understand the language, people, feel it and if we're doing um, and one of the things is like if we're doing a very sentimental sad uh, perform dance performance at the end of the dance you'll see a lot of people with tears in their eyes without actually uh, verbally explaining what the dance is about. They feel it because we follow the flow of the dance movement. And I'm sure Nana's dance is the same thing too, because I think that's what the dance, dance is all about, I think.
Yeah. Nina, can we can we turn to you? Sure, absolutely. So um, I, I will say that in Bharatanatyam and Kuchipuri, there are two subcategories of dance. One is called Tandavam, and it's a male, masculine, very um, analytical way of dancing. And there's a second one called Lasyam, which is a very feminine, easygoing, graceful um, subcategory of dance. And normally in any dance piece, in any Bhatanatim dance piece, you will see uh, fluidity of both. And you'll see a depiction of a very masculine character and then to contradict that, the depiction of a very feminine character. And I do think that that, especially that uh, duality in dance brings power to the message and inspires the audience. Um, I know Mari was talking about how, you know, women and men um, use different gestures to depict that and that inspires a, a reaction out of the audience and following that invisible line and the flow of emotion. And I think one of the things I so dearly love about Indian classical dance is that a spark is there every time an emotion is depicted, every time a character is introduced. And I, I do my best to you know, inspire that spark and ignite that kind of reaction by embodying the holistic nature of the character. But I do think that, you know, that invisible flow of the line is, how, while it's beautiful, it certainly, it, I don't think it is so applicable to Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi because that sharpness of movement is something that I know we pride ourselves on and um, the immediateness of any emotion that is shown, whether that's a stamp on the ground or a look or a hand gesture, the, the immediateness of that gesture to be conveyed in a strategic way that gives an audience a holistic view of the, the scenery that you're trying to depict. That to me is what's so important about Bharatanatyam. And I tend to like Dandavam dances because they're so precise and very um, technical. So um, I know Mari was mentioning the um, how you ground yourself on the floor to be dancing as one with the earth. And it's very similar for Bharatanatyam. Um, the prayer that we do at the beginning kind of pays homage to the ground, Mother Earth, um, because we're dancing on her and to become one with that earth and ground yourself through that dancing process is um, important for me as a dancer. But I do think that you know, the sharpness of that movement and the real experience of that dance is what leads it to be, you know, so powerful in the way that it's depicted and communicated. And I think that um, when you look at that staunch, you know, variety or, or that um, that difference, right, in in Thandavam versus Lasyam, um, there's beauty in both. And I think it inspires me as a dancer to use gesture because Tandavam in and of itself doesn't mean anything. The word means, you know, masculine dancing, but unless I bring life to that word um, through the use of facial expressions. So if it's, a, you know, a king really, um, creating that facial structure of samam is what we call it. So expressionless almost, or, um, you know, stagnation. So you would make your face very still. Um, so as to represent, you know, power and 
kind of that enlightenment and upper class feeling, but maybe if I was depicting, you know, um, Bamana is a is a like an uh, incarnation of one of the gods Vishnu, and he um, is meant to be depicted as very very small initially, um, until you know you can see that incarnation of him into a god. And so using those facial expressions, you know, of, of clenched fists to kind of bring inwards into your body and your head down, that is important, you know, technically to be able to embody that word of Thandama. But Lasyam, on the other hand, you know, the way that we walk is very um, focused on the hips. So your hips swinging and your shoulders swinging and your arms swinging, that that entirety of movement and that entirety of gesture, the hands, we call them dola hasta. So in Tandavam, it's very straight and strict the way you move hands. And Mari alluded to this, the use of every nerve and every muscle is so calculated, but in Lasyam, it's an opportunity to let go of that kind of um, stiffness of the dance and allow yourself to be you know, free and you know, emote, especially. Um, and I think that that use of gesture in, in seeing the duality of both Dandavam and Lasyam, you know, upper class versus lower class, you know, male versus female, status, respectability versus like vilification, um, all of those really contribute to the overall experience of dance in Paripanakyam and Kuchipu. Um, as Nina explained, a lot of the, her explanations, they, um, uh, they work for the Japanese dance also. Except there's one thing that we do not do is when we walk, or uh, this is uh, men's style or the female style, you know, male style, uh, we do not move our hips. We do not move hips side to side. And when we walk, we do not walk and make our head go up and down, up and down. There is a special uh, a basic posture called kamae, K-A-M-A-E. It's a basic, basic uh, posture for Japanese dance where you tuck in your lower tummy, bring your sternum out, get your shoulder blades to, together, and bring your shoulders back and stand in a straight position. And uh, for the adults, in a, uh, when they first start learning, we practice that walk over and over and over so we don't jump our heads doesn't go up and down up and down or we don't shake this this is not japanese dance when we move our hips back and forth we have to put that hip straight keep it and when we uh when we so-called bend we have to bring our whole body down, straight down. We don't mean to the one side, to the other. We try to maintain that uh, kamae posture. That's, I think that's one thing that's totally different from your Indian dance. Okay, I have a question for you, Naina. Uh, when, when you do a male dance, is your costume different from the female dance uh, costume? So sometimes it can be. Uh, normally in Bharatanatyam, we just because of, you know, technical issues, we can't change costumes that often um, just because of the elaborateness of each costume. But I think um, I've had many instances where I am playing um, you know, a king, only a king, and I will be wearing 
you know, um, the same outfit, but a crown maybe, or have different makeup. I think in terms of costume, there isn't much variation, but um, there is variation to the accessories that we use. And more importantly than costume, I think, um, when I'm portraying a male character, whether it's, you know, a demon, normally demons are male in um, the Indian stories, um, I find that it is even more um, authentic and genuine when I don't have any of those props and I don't have a crown and I don't have, you know, a, a mustache drawn on and I don't, I don't have any of those masculine features, but somehow the masculinity of the dance and the the aura of it is is depicted from within and i think that that is especially important obviously for female dancing there is a a little bit of a difference i'll have my hair you know towards the front just to give you know a little bit more of like a a, a modern feminine look if you will or a stereotypically feminine look i would say um and you know the way that i walk i'll wear more jewelry i'll wear you know blush higher up even so that kind of gesturing even with makeup is so important but um i want to break off a little bit from here to also discuss how i do think that it's important for me as a dancer to realize that there are different sides to femininity and different sides to masculinity and I think it's important for all of us as dancers. I know I have been taught, you know, there's a way to dress masculinely and a way to dress femininely. But I think to to make dance truly more modern, which is is what I try to do with my nonprofit, uh, to truly make dance more modern, we have to understand, you know, the different sides to femininity and to masculinity. Maybe it's not always a puffed out chest and you know, staunch, you know, facial features and, you know, very stiff movement. But maybe there is a, a more feminine side to masculinity that we can depict to make characters more holistic. I think um, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, kind of acknowledge some of those shortcomings of gesture and um, how we, you know, work to bridge that gap between stereotypical femininity and, femininity, excuse me, and stereotypical masculinity and depict holistic characters, you know, bring life to the the sides, the the multifaceted nature of each character, whether that be feminine or masculine, and really, you know, modernize that idea of dance in that there isn't only feminine and masculine. There is, you know, there's it's a multifaceted approach that we as dancers um, need, need to be taking. Okay, um, for Japanese dance, um, as far as the costume goes, you know we have female costumes, kimono, and male kimonos that are totally different. Where you could you could by looking at it, you know, understand what which you know, gender we're trying to uh, portray. But there, um, as Nana said, there is a different grade of being uh, feminine and being masculine. And Japanese dance in the same way too. There are different grades and different ways of portraying that. And one thing, there's another th what, uh, special thing in Japanese dancing is called suodori, S-U-O-D-O-R-I, which means you dance with no elaborate costumes. And most of the time, this type of dance is done to do a celebration dance where there's no actually female or male. It's just, it's just combined, <laughs> you know, and we, we don't uh, dance a celebration dance, uh, totally female style, 
totally male style. It's just that there is called that there's uh, uh, style called the suodori, which means you are not either. Okay. And uh, uh, one thing for us, we could differentiate most of the time with our makeup and the hairstyle too, female and, you know, it's much easier for the audience to uh, identify female and male because we do put make different makeup, our hair is different, our kimono is different. So, but like Nina said, we have to really uh, come through from the inner emotion to show that too, in, you know, instead of just relying on the kimono costumes that we wear. And then one other very important thing uh, in Japanese dancing or Japanese, um, it's like Japanese dancing and uh, kendo is the fencing, Japanese fencing and taiko and certain type of martial art. It's, there is a special uh, word called ma, M-A. And it's, the ma is interval in time or space. And so what it is, is that in music, there's notes, right? There's, there's a space or time in between the two notes that we use to put that emotion in. And it's, it's something that you cannot I cannot teach you. It comes with the training. Comes with the training and listening to the music. It's the move. It comes in inside that flow of the movement, Nina. It's called ma. And that's very, very important in our culture. Nina, do you have any any things that, that came up for you in that conversation or um, I can direct at this point too? No, um, yeah, I would be happy to have you um, direct. I just think sure. um, it's, it's so interesting to see that, you know, difference of culture. And um, I do agree wholeheartedly with what Mari said in that we need to, you know, not rely on, on costume and rely on, you know, external features to, you know, internal feelings. And I, I have also realized, um, I know I'm, I'm very young and, um, but I, throughout my dance career, I have, it's not something that you learn, interestingly enough, through training. It's not something that you learn through practice. It just, that, that genuine and authentic emotion that, and, when I have danced from time to time, I, I cry on stage. And it's interesting to me how, how much just a gesture or a combination of gestures can inspire such a reaction in me. And, you know, I'm dancing on stage, I can't cry, but um, I've definitely teared up and, and seeing how, you know, I don't, that, that, internal i know mari says it's called ma in her culture i don't we don't have a name for it but that devotion to an art art form that is so genuine and you know authentic and and a burning fire in you to you know emote to the best of your ability and to inspire people to feel what you're feeling because i know for me when i dance what i feel is so strong and when i see other people dance you know, I, I find myself making facial expressions and, you know, crying and laughing. And it really is that, that you know, intertwined experience of dancer versus audience. And to be able to, you know, look at different cultures, I think, and, and see how 
they bridge the gap between audience and dancer, I think is so important. Mm -hmm. And there are other other relationships happening, right? You all are, you're not dancing in silence, right? You are dancing with musicians, um, either live or recorded. Um, Nena, beginning with you and then and then Mari, um, what are those interactions in Bharatanatyam? Right, so I have a, um, a unique look at this because my brother is actually a Mridangam artist. Um, I might be a little biased, but he's one of the most talented that I've seen. And I just, having a family member who I'm so closely cl connected to, you know, in, in real life, like my brother is my, is my best friend. And I remember um, I had a Kuchipuri workshop here is my first um, activity for collectivity. And my brother actually played the Mridangam while I was dancing and my teacher was singing. And um, I've had the you know distinct honor to work with several live musicians who are the best in their fields. Um, I remember from my Arangetram, that's like the coming of age dance, the graduation dance. Um, I got to work with you know a rhythm pad artist, a flautist, a vocalist, a mridangam artist, um, and and to see how integral that relationship is between dancer and musician is is interesting to me so um I'll, I'll begin with my brother because i just kind of have the best insight into that relationship um and and this is anecdotal i realize but i have never felt more connected to my dance than when my brother played the Mridangam for me. And it's that, it's an inexplicable type of magic that happens when you connect to your, you know, instrumentalists and the dancer. And I, I think that goes back to, you know, what we were saying about dance being an experience. Because a lot of people look at good dance as an isolated thing. You know you're a good you're a good dancer but to be a good dancer or to be a great dancer in my opinion is to be a great performer and the performance occurs when musicians and dancers you know i i had several practices with the live musicians and you know figuring out the exact right time to hit this you know um string of uh you know, rhythm pad notes. So if I was, you know, depicting somebody walking through thunder, like that exact time when the rhythm pads would, you know, click on that sound. And, and that's what I think is so important about performance art is really what I think of dance as. It's not dance, it's performance. And it's so integral to have that, that bonding between instruments and dance because it really leads into one another, I think, beautifully. So that that drumming can, can emphasize and articulate that emotion that the dancer is trying to show. So I think um, it, it's incredible that you brought that up because we talk about gestures in the body of a dancer, but I find that especially, you know, I'm so biased, but when my brother plays the Mridangam, those, those, you know, emotions and gestures are inspired through that, are inspired through, um, and the person who played the Mridangam for my Arangetram is actually my brother's teacher, Guru. And, you know, I have a, a great relationship with all of those instrumentalists. And, and I think that really leads beautifully into the emotion and the connection I'm trying to, you know, facilitate between myself and the audience. And so I think that that's such an important part of, you know, gesture, if you will, like instrumental gesture and how that really can inspire a key portion of any performance. I agree with uh, Nana about having uh, 
family members get involved in with your performance because uh, as far as um, music for our Japanese dancing, it's not possible to have live musicians here in Tucson. So we use pre-recorded music for our performance. I have two sons. The older one is a DJ, and so he helps me with the sound system. Anytime we go performance, and my younger son, uh, he does MC for our performance, and he's been uh, doing that for two, at Tucson Meet Yourself for years now, and uh, and it's so important to have your family members help you know, in, get involved and help you and encourage you to your, for your performance. Because your performance, you cannot do the performance by yourself. You need the support of everybody else. And for myself, it's my sons and my students and all the fans that have been, you know, following us throughout all my performances. And uh, now uh, I have um, uh, the grandsons, one grandson and two granddaughters dancing with me, performing with me all the time. And they come to Tucson Meet Yourself from Mesa. But it's very important and I am so happy to hear that you are so proud of your brothers. The family uh, support is very, very important if you want to keep on performing. Absolutely. And I do think that um, I want to kind of branch on, on what I, I was talking about. I do think family, I am privileged to have a brother that does this, but I, I do think that, um, you know, dance is and our arts in general are such a unique way to form communities um and i know that we were speaking about this earlier but to have it doesn't have to be my brother you know it just to have um a connection with somebody who you're working with um and i think that goes for you know all fields of work um to connect with the people that uh you're working with and it's especially important i feel in dance it's because that connection builds motion. And um, I consider that like uh, a tool to amplify the emotion that I'm trying to convey. Um, any emotion that I have, any connection that I have to the people that I work with only betters my performance. And so I think it doesn't, like Madi said, it doesn't um, have to be a family member. It can be anybody who you know you have a connection with or you want to build a connection with that can um, better that dancing experience and that performance experience for everybody involved. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> um, Mari, uh, you said uh, it's, and perhaps the reason is it's difficult to find um, Japanese uh, musicians or players of Japanese instruments, uh, the shamisen, for example, here in Tucson, but um, when you are as a dancer interacting with your music, whether it's live or recorded, um, how, what is that interaction? Um, Nana, you were speaking about how you're really interacting physically, gesturally with different sorts of strikes on the drum itself. Um, and that, that's very much a conversation you and the drummer are in. Madi, what, what is that conversation like in, in your tradition? Um, as far as for us, since it's pre-recorded music, we try to understand what that music, mu music is trying to convey. And so we first, what I always tell my students is listen to the music over and over and over more than 100 times before you perform, because then you 
you will inhale all that uh, the Oh, what's what the musicians are trying to convey to you through your skins, not just through your ears, through your skins, and then that will help you bring that inner emotion out. And so, um, one time I went to California, that's eight to nine hours drive coming back. All the time I was in California, I was there a whole week. I was trying to choreograph one dance. And I listened to that, that music from the start of my trip to coming back. Nothing else, the same music. So I must have listened to it, I don't know how many hundred times, but and when I do that, and when I play the music to actually perform, everything, every, all that music is just coming through my skin, and I'm able to bring it out in my dancing. So, uh, you know, I wish we could do a live, mu you know, music because it, it is totally different because I've, I've done that in California with the live musicians and it's totally different experience. And most of my students have never uh, had the oppor opportunity to do that. So what, what, is, what is the difference for you? Um, you know, pre-recorded music, you still feel the power coming from the musicians, but the actual live performance musicians, the power is totally different. It's like going to a concert versus listening to it on, on your you know computer or uh, just pre-recorded music. It's totally different because you feel the power straight to you. And it's like, I call it, uh, you feel the netsu. Netsu is N-E-T-S-U. The temperature, fever, you feel that musicians, the uh, temperature coming through to you, and, and that turns into a power. And then so special power comes into you and your performance. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not doing 100% on pre-recorded music, but it is different. You put more into it because your your the power is just back of you, just pushing you to bring out more emotions. Absolutely, Nana. Any follow-ups to that on uh, things that that occurred? No, I I just agree with what Mari said. I think that it's you know important to um, you know feel that you know, she was talking about temperature and that that fever. I think it, it is a huge part of dance for me is just, um, and I hate to sound, you know, like um, surface level about this, but it really is about the importance that you give to something that makes it that much more frontal in your brain, right? So when you give music that importance and equally as important, um, you give it an equal amount of importance as dance. You can really, um, you know, put that in the forefront of your mind as a as a, a way to lead the experience. And that's why it's so important for me to foster, you know, relationships with, you know, my my musicians, the people who play music for me, because, you know, it really is that that inexplicable kind of magic that that happens that makes the performance so much better. Thank you. 
we're, believe it or not, coming towards the end of our time already. Um, and so I think perhaps in closing a question about um, sort of a what's next question, but hopefully more interesting than your normal one. What, what is exciting for you about the next stages of your dancing? To looking forward. Mari, if, you, if you want to begin. Oh, okay. Um, my next stage uh, motivation comes from uh, receiving award from the uh, Southwest Folk Life, you know, uh, uh, award and then a woman of the year award that pushes that uh, pushes me more to uh, try harder to go forward to be able to uh, for me to be able to teach and show everybody what I have learned from my mentor and what, you know, what I'm trying to teach to the next generation of the students and to the audience who are living in such a diverse, you know, community that we are, you know, we are able to see so many different cultures and to learn and to work with them, you know, uh, to, for me, to better myself. And so um, it my thing for the next phase of my dancing is to try to uh, teach or, or convey the respect uh, that you want from your you want your students to have toward the community, toward your uh, performance, and to toward the family and friends and everybody around you, most importantly, respect, learn to respect yourself. That's, that's my belief. If you cannot respect yourself, you cannot respect anybody else. It's like you cannot love anybody if you don't love yourself. So that's, that's my next phase to try to keep this respect and and these ideas going for me to the next generation people who are not all Japanese anymore. If they are so now we have so many uh, 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 people that's. Uh, the children from mixed marriages. And so they, they have so many cultural backgrounds that, that they need to respect so that they could respect yourself. Thank and you so much. So um, I think for me, I echo a lot of what Mari said about um, self-respect. I think that it's important as a, a growing individual, you know, at my age, I'm 17, but to cultivate that sense of self-respect and um, I don't wanna say self-admiration, but the admiration for the work that you believe in, um, I think that is very important. And um, I, don't, I don't plan on pursuing dance as a career in life, but I do think that it's it holds a special place in my heart in terms of lessons that it has taught me and 
will continue to teach me. I don't intend on stopping dancing anytime soon, but um, to just know, I think the most important thing that I've learned from dance is a sense of cultivating that internal appreciation for the work that I do. And I think, you know, as a society, I think it's so easy to get caught up in what people are saying about your dance. Um, you know, oh, your dance was so great. Or, you know, I really think you could have improved on this portion. And while it's important to take those criticisms, I think moving forward, it's important for me to cultivate a, a singular and truly self-fueled idea of what it means to be a dancer, you know, for, for myself, what it means to be a performer and to let to let personal uh, personal emotion and personal opinion drive the work that I do. And instead of letting, you know, outside opinion dictate what I choose to portray. Um, and I think that goes back to a lot of what, what Mari was saying about, you know, sureness of self and the sureness of what of what I'm trying to portray, the work I'm trying to do. And and I don't want to sound, um, you know, ex, like a, extremely spiritual about this. I don't, for me, dance has not become that spiritual experience yet. Um, and, and I look forward to having the, those moments where I truly feel, you know, connected to higher self um, and, and, as of right now, dance is an activity that I love to do and I find a lot of meaning in, but to be able to appreciate that, the spirituality of it, and and I've seen firsthand, you know, the, the places that dance can take people to. Um, the sureness that, that a dance, uh, it's such a, an odd example to use, but I was really holding off on saying something to somebody that I wanted to say to them. And I performed a dance about this this woman kind of saying all these things to her husband, and it was it, it solidified my sense of you know confidence. And I ended up acting on you know what I uh, that experience where I was like I really should say something to this person, and you know I ended up doing it because of that dance. And I've seen firsthand the you know powerful reactions that it can inspire but i think to to recognize the the spirituality of it all and you know to to a lot of people you know dance is just dance lacrosse is lacrosse basketball is basketball and i know basketball or lacrosse doesn't have a lot of emotion involved but i think to every physical sport is what i consider my type of dancing, at least, um, there has to be some sort of higher purpose as to why I do it. And I'm looking forward to, you know, bringing that emotion into dancing, you know, whether it's, you know, paying respect to a family member or whether it's, you know, bringing attention to uh, an issue that I think is really important. Um, that that variety that is there in you know, what I can portray if I have the confidence to do so, um, I think is, is a very powerful idea for me and, you know, lights a fire within me to continue that, you know, line of, I, I say work, but that, that line of dancing um, and, and really see how, to continue to see how it can affect people in such a meaningful way. I think is what motivates me to continue to, you know, strive for that higher purpose of what dance means to me. Kate, may I say one more thing? Of course. Um, as, as for me, and I think it's as for any uh, performers, um, there is no top where you stop and say, this is it. I know everything. I've done everything. For me, when I get to one point, there's another step 
of learning, bettering myself. And for me, that comes from my students. Students are teaching me every time for me to be a better sensei. They are my sensei to teach me myself. Sensei is S-E-N-S-E-I, a teacher, instructor. And they are the ones that's teaching me to become a better sensei each time. And they're the one that pushes me to keep on going. And Nena, I hope I get to see you keep on going too. Thank you. I hope to see, you know, myself growing as well, hopefully. But, um, and I'm honored to be a part of this discussion with somebody as accomplished as you. And, um, you Thank know, you. To, to look into these gestures, I think is so important. And, um, you know, I know this, this discussion transitioned into something much more spiritual and much more, you know, deep and philosophical. But I do think that, you know, that's the whole purpose of dance is to really take surface level things that could be surface level gestures per se and and frame them in such a philosophically um, challenging way and yeah so I'm really honored to have been part of this panel and thank you I'm so glad that you could both be here Mari Kaneta Suzuki who is the founder director of the Suzuki Kai Japanese Dance School in Tucson Nena Babinupati, Bharatanatyam and Kuchipudi dancer, um, founder of the um, Collectivity Nonprofit. Thank you both so much for your time, for your commitment to Tucson, to the festival, um, to your traditions. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you and to hear so much about uh, the, these dances that um, give so much to you and to the people around you. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you at home. <laughs>